Hey guys, you're now listening to the Coaches Network podcast, a podcast aimed at anyone who's passionate about athlete, talent, and personal development. My name's Coach Yas, and I'm a UEFA A licensed football coach, coach developer, and content creator. I'll be sitting down with a range of guests to discuss their journeys, their life lessons, and how you can make an impact. Enjoy. Episode of the Coaches Network, guys. I'm Coach Yas, and today, as usual, I'm joined by my co host, Ben. How you doing, Ben? All good. Ready for an insightful chat. Perfect. And we've got a very special guest with us today. Currently the under-17s head coach at Roma, Fabrizio Picaretta. How are you, Fabrizio? Hi, hi guys. Uh, I'm fine. Thanks for uh, this uh, invitation and um, I'm very glad to, to, to join this, uh, this podcast. Fantastic. Fabrizio, we're not going to waste any time. You don't want to get right to the heart of the conversation. Just want to let us know a bit about where your coaching journey started and how you've got to where you've got to today. Uh, as uh, likewise uh, other other people like me uh, that uh, the, um, I played uh, football in the past, I, I started coaching uh, um, in the last uh, club for the last club I played uh, in 2003. I remember I, I I haven't played at high level as a as a footballer. Uh, it was like a semi-professional uh, club in Italy, and uh, I've been offered the chance to to coach. A youth, a youth team. I remember it was a under 16 team, and uh, to be honest with you, I, I was uh, very, very excited to to, to remain in football. Uh, and uh, I remember those days like st- still with uh, with pleasure because it was my very first step into coaching. Uh, of course, I'm not the same coach that I was uh, in 2003 because. Uh, uh, all the experience that changed me in some in some way, but I remember that uh, some of the principles that uh, I used to uh, to have in those days are still uh, here, are still with me. So this means that uh, we 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 must remain what we are uh, as a person. And uh, but yeah, it was uh, a club called San Remese in Italy. Uh, is a club that in the past have had had some um, success in the, in the lower leagues. Uh, as I said, I, I never been a top professional, um, but yeah, I, I I played good football, and uh, I'm happy because in I remember always a couple of players that I had in the first in the first team I, I coached uh, in 2003 that. Uh, have progressed and uh, they had the chance to to play in Serie A in Italy and uh, so this is something that I remember very fondly. So Fabrizio, just going to pause you there for a second. Um, I don't know whether it's um, so yeah. You said you were saying there about you know you've been uh, you ready, Ben? Yeah. Um, you were just obviously touching on there the fact that you know you've gone through that that experience. You know, initially playing, you said you didn't really play it to a high standard, but obviously I think one key thing you touched on there is about how your philosophy has developed over the years, you know, based on your experiences and I guess the different environments that you've worked within. Just, do you mind just talking to that a little bit around what your philosophy actually is? Uh, listen, as you said, I, uh, my experience uh, throughout the, the, the years have, uh, you know, I've progressed and I, I had the chance to work in different environments, starting from a, a youth level in a semi-professional club, then a head coach in a, uh, amateur club in Italy, semi-professional clubs. Then all of a sudden, I had the chance to move to England, uh, working as assistant manager, first team coach, uh, if you like, uh, in a profession, in a, first in League Two, then League One, then in a, in top level uh, club like Sunderland. So uh, once again, abroad, Italy, back. Uh, I I think I covered all the areas of uh, coaching, <laughs> if you if you if you like. So. Um, my philosophy has, of course, has changed, uh, but something has remained has remained uh, uh, very clear in my mind. Mm, I think that football is uh, a non-linear uh, activity. So, I mean, I, we, of course, there are uh, there is something that uh, defines football, but. Uh, every single game, every single uh, uh, at every level is always different. You know, we can recognize some patterns if you want or principles, but 
uh, football is, is non-linear. We can't uh, predict, we can't, um, yes, we can work on something that we, we, we can try to make happen, but uh, everything can change in a while. In a while. So um, it's a situational game. So I, uh, in terms of coaching philosophy, I've tried always to keep in mind this. So uh, if football is non non-linear, I can't coach linearly. I have to be non-linear also in my coaching philosophy. I mean, uh, trying to um, stick to the reality of football. So, uh, with regard to my coaching philosophy, I can say that, uh, firstly, if you, for example, come to watch a training session of mine, you will see always um, players playing football. Uh, and then, within that structure, I try to coach the principles that uh, define my, my game model. So I, I start from the, from the top and I go to the bottom. So I don't do the, uh, the, the other way around. So I don't think that football is like a, a construct something from the, uh, little pieces, but try to uh, have the clear, the, the big picture and then try to coach the single parts within the big chip, the big picture. So I don't know if it makes sense in English because my English is not that. Uh, just, to, just to clarify that part. But, so like, um, you will start with like, in terms of like training methodology, as like the pitch as a whole, and then exactly. you break it down into the little bits, basically. It, yes, it, it, rather than the way the other way around, which is something that it was very used. Uh, especially in Italy until uh, 10, 15 years ago, where you could see uh, coaches trying to build a, a coaching session uh, with small exercises, small, small part of football, and then trying to put them together, thinking that the players can recognize the, the, the whole picture. I think it doesn't work. I think that uh, you have to have in mind very clearly what is your game model, uh, so basically, what is a game model? Is your philosophy? Is what you want your players do uh, to do in a, in the all the situations that can happen in football? Um, and then from there, trying to define and refine all the details of your uh, all, all or the, uh, of all the situations that that uh, happen during the game. Uh, let's say, for example, uh, in football. The situations are uh, millions and millions. We can, as I said before, we can predict uh, what uh, can happen uh, in uh, 30 seconds ahead. So how can I give solutions, for example, to my players uh, with regard to starting from the playing, uh, playing uh, build up from the back? So I can't say to my players, OK, now the ball goes to the center back, then go to the full back. And no, I, I, it doesn't work like that because there, there are always um, uh, the, the, the opponents that can disrupt all the plans that we're trying to build. So what is uh, interesting for me is to try to uh, um, make my players understand the space, the time, how to create a space, how to create your uh, space for yourself and for your teammates, the solutions. Uh, that are uh, specific for that moment. I can't give. I can't. I cannot provide my players few solutions. Let's say I, I still hear coaches, colleagues that say, from um, to to build up from the back. I give my team five solutions. Uh, how can I give five solutions when there are millions and millions of solutions? I can't. Pre um, predict all the solutions. So it's better to uh, teach, coach the players to understand the space, the, to create the space and so on. I think just touching on that, you know, it, it kind of uh, resonates with me quite a lot because my, my thing is that you're right, you can't give them all the solutions, but what you can certainly do, and this is, a, I guess, a large part of my own philosophy is about working with the players to raise their awareness of the possibilities that could occur. Exactly. So, for instance, if we are, take your example, you know, playing out from the back, okay, right, this is the way I'd probably, I might have a way I want it done. However, I have to be mindful that, okay, as soon as that ball releases from the goalkeeper, so let's say the nearest centre-back as an example, 
right? What are the possibilities that could occur? Okay, the forward player could come from this side, the forward player could come from this side and this side, or whatever that is. What? And it's almost, right, if this happens, this is how we might counter it. If this happens, this is how we might counter that, or vice versa. And I think, it, for me personally, it gets to a point where I'm never really trying to tell my players what to do. I'm more just uh, are challenging them and maybe raising their awareness around some of the things they need to consider in the process as opposed to provide them with the solution. But if I, if I, I believe that if we do raise their awareness enough to the variables that could occur, you're right, there's so many variables that could occur. But if we think about maybe the major ones that possibly could occur, then hopefully that will equip them enough to understand how to maybe navigate around that situation or completely away from that situation. But if they're now stuck in the middle of it, they should know how to maybe deal with that better, if that makes sense. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, I, it's exactly what I'm trying to do. And uh, of course, uh, then someone can, uh, can ask me, okay, how can you uh, raise the awareness of your players? So for example, uh, again, start talking about building up from the back. I don't give solutions, but I try to tell them and to make them aware of what can happen. Let's say uh, my center back, receive the ball from uh, from the goalkeeper uh, if the press the pressing from the opponent come from a wide area he knows that uh, the solution can be related to this kind of pressure if the pressure come from uh, ahead of him then the solution can be completely different and one um, thing that i always try to 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 convince my players to do especially the center backs is when you receive the ball from your fellow center back or from the goalkeeper, don't open straight away your foot to play wide because otherwise you kill all the options that you can have. Because then if you if you turn yourself, your body wide, then the opponent knows that you, you, you're gonna play wide and then it's a trigger start, uh, it's a trigger point for the opponent to press. So try always to close your um, foot and um, keep your options open so to play uh, switch on the other side to play in front of you uh, then you uh, you have players that are more um, let's say um, yeah are, get more awareness of the possibilities of the uh, of the the options that they have in front uh, then you have to work on their head because uh, all if you if you watch um, very uh, if you watch all, even a top top uh, players top top level football you you will always not always often uh, find center backs that do the, do this so open the foot and then play wide and then normally the center back have no problem but then the fullback will have problems because they will have always players trying to press and then there are no options, just play maybe uh, kicking the ball forward. Uh, so there is no progression. In, in, uh, while I think if you convince the centre-backs to do this, then it can sound a bit more risky for them at the, uh, in, uh, in first, uh, at the first moment. But then when they understand that this can give more options, then we grow also in uh, self-esteem because they can start to to think about themselves. Okay, now I can. I'm not just the one who passed the ball wide, but I can build uh, something interesting for um, for an effective for for my team. I I found this very effective, uh, especially with young players. Um, I and specifically last season with a player centre back, very very good centre back in terms of physical structure, uh, strong in terms of tackle, uh, very good defensively, but um, who was lacking a bit um, this confidence, self-confidence by playing from the back. And he was one of those players who always tried to uh, release uh, the pressure by playing to the fullback. And then the problems will start to, start to, to happen to the fullback. Then I tried to work with him, uh, of course, in the coaching sessions, in the training sessions, and try to convince him that even if it, mm, he was not so sure, but once he started to understand that this was something that 
was beneficial for him and for the team, his self-esteem, his self-confidence grown uh, dramatically, and uh, he, he started to to improve also other areas where he he was not so uh, great. So I think that this is one example for. But other examples are, um, I that are part of my coaching philosophy. I want my players to clear the structure of the of the team. The structure is the shape that we have to keep on the field. So how to occupy the space uh, in terms of width, in terms of uh, depth, uh, but to be free within that structure. I'm not very interested in to to see that my fullbacks, for example, are, are always overlapping. I like to see my fullbacks coming inside and play as a midfielder, for example, as long as someone else will occupy that space. And and my team, I have to be honest, one of the, 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 the main uh, satisfactions as a coach that I have is to see my players playing freely in, within that uh, organization. I'm, my team is not a team that everyone do something, you know, his own without any connection with the others. But you can see at some point players out of their positions playing uh, exactly what 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 they had to do in that position. Even if 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 for example, is a fullback that go inside as a play, playing as a midfielder or a winger uh, dropping to receive the ball from the centre back. Everyone feel free to play, but still maintaining that uh, the regional structure of the of the team. And just on that, you know, you talk there about essentially everyone having a bit of freedom. Um, we'd just be interested to know your thoughts. Obviously, at, at the moment we're on a lock. You know, we're we're coming out of this pandemic. We've been on the lockdown, um, and with the whole social distancing thing, there's a lot of emphasis on non-contact training. How would you go about maybe uh, designing a session around some of those principles in the current climate? To be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we never. Whoever can can uh, can claim to to have the solution for this uh, is a liar, because no no one has had the experience of something like this before. And how can I? Eat? And also. Uh, I will just restart my my season in first uh, early in August. So uh, since uh, last March, I never been in a football pitch, uh, uh, and I here uh, we never had the chance to like in other countries to to start the uh, the training sessions with this no social distance uh, stuff. So I hope, to be honest, and I had uh, uh, this uh, news from from the club that. When we will start, we we will restart in a normal way, so with the contact and uh, no social distance. To be honest, uh, how once again, from my point of view, what whatever we can do uh, without contact uh, is is not football, <laughs> it's fake. Uh, it's something that we do just to to fill the the the, 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 the void, you know, but. Okay. So just just on that then, what are your thoughts in terms of unopposed training work? Uh, I the, the all the bad things that I can uh, I, I can think uh, I I don't believe in unopposed uh, work. I I believe in uh, I don't like like what they call uh, in England. I remember this shadow play or something like like that. Uh, excuse me. The pattern play. Pattern, patterns of play. What is a pattern of play? Is, is the same as we said before. Uh, how can I give a pattern of? So I can. What? I, how can I decide before the the, the 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 path of the ball in the football pitch? No, uh, an opposed play is something that uh, is like uh, to to box with the with the with the air, not without any opponent. Uh, I believe that the reality of the uh, of the of the game, the football is a uh, is about someone else who wants to to steal the ball from you. Mm. And uh, of course, I know that there are coaches that like to to do this. I didn't, I have nothing against them. Of course, everyone because in football, I think that there is nothing right or wrong. You know, but 
I believe in what I do. And I always thought this. Even when I was a player, I started to, to think about this when I was a player. And that was the time because unfortunately I'm 55 and quite old. And when I used to play, it was the, the, the a period of time in Italy where uh, normally Friday was the, the day where the coach, when the coach started to do this um, unopposed uh, movements. And I was wondering, how can uh, the coach think that this will happen on Sunday when the opponent will do something to, 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 to oppose, to, uh, to avoid this? And it, of course, and as a coach, I do the same. I always try to uh, work tactically with opponents, but opponents that want to disrupt what I want to build, because this is the only way to um, for the players to experience the, the reality of the game. Otherwise, I can't think that if I want to uh, make their life their life easier in in a, in a session in a coaching session, then how can I think that they will? Uh, um, deal with the, with the, the pressure, with the, the opponents trying to, to steal the ball in the game. So um, I never, never uh, use this uh, 11 against, against uh, 0 or 6 against 0. Um, no. I, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, it's a conversation that we've had recently with a few other coaches, and I, you know, I feel that personally, on the unopposed versus opposed off. My go-to is never to go unopposed. But if I was to do any unopposed work, then it'll be in the in that process of going to the unopposed, I'd already maybe painted the context of which I want the players to focus their decisions around, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And uh, uh, somehow this can be uh, the only, the only uh, part of unopposed work that I can... Uh, let's say um, understand but still I think that let's say if you want to uh, what are principle in football uh, movements let's say okay I want uh, let's say that uh, I want to teach my coach my my players to uh, to move uh, in a certain way, a rotation, a rotational uh, movement, let's say, midfielder that uh, drop, uh, winger comes in and fullback that overlap, typical. Um, if I, if I, okay, it's easier, it's easier maybe to, to coach this without opponents, but uh, then the players will uh, still, they don't have the real uh, point of reference because the, mm, the opponents are not just people that want to 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 steal the ball from from you. Are also, uh, I think they serve as a reference point to understand the space. So, how can I move in a space without uh, any reference point, which is given given by the opponent, by the position of the opponents? Uh, maybe if we have the chance once. <laughs> And in the future, I, I would like to show you maybe some clips of what I do in the sessions. But um, even in my coaching sessions, when I, I coach the build-up from the back, I didn't even tell the opponents, the position, what to do. I give them freedom also to the opponents. So because I don't want my players that my in possession to know in advance what the opponents are going to do. So I give all the freedom that I can. And then, as I said before, this is the whole picture. So you have to start, you have to build up from the back. And your, your target is to move the ball beyond the first line of pressure of the opponents. So that is the target because then you build. But if I see that everything goes like uh, according to the game model, according to the principle, okay, we clap hands, let's, well done. If I realize that the choice made, and by, made by, by one of my players in possession is wrong, wrong I mean not uh, coherent, not consistent with, uh, with uh, the game model, then I stop and I say, I ask the player, why you play this uh, there? Why you play this pass? Uh, where, um, 
what were, were the options that you could and I always try to involve my players in, uh, in this uh, um, I ask feedback, I ask questions, I don't give them once again, I, I don't tell them hey, that was the solution I ask them think, the situation was this why you choose this uh, option rather than, this, than the other one so in this way I think you, you involve the players in the build-up and, and this is something that gives them responsibility, uh, accountability of uh, their game. And then uh, I know it's, I don't like to have easy life in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in my training session. I like to, uh, to challenge the players and myself to find, there are moments, and I'm very proud of it, uh, I, um, we played in one game uh, uh, against a team that was very uh, aware of what we want to do and they tried to stop us. At some point, one of my players did something that uh, killed all the, the confidence of the opponent, but was something that I never told to them. Mm. It, was, it, it came from this, um, let's say, this awareness of uh, the space and, and this player uh, came out with the, with the solution that struck me and struck also the opponents and that from them that point that moment on everything started to to work for us and um, and not for the opponent so and this is something that when the when the players uh, let's say up, upgrade uh, their their knowledge is uh, something that uh, make 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 me proud yeah, like just from kind of hearing uh, hearing you all through this, it's it's kind of like um, engaging the picture of like you you create that sort of framework uh, for the players to operate in, but like there is license for them to have some freedom of it. Of course, it has, they can't like deter so much from uh, the framework, otherwise it starts to counteract what you're trying to do as a whole. Um, but like like you said, that example there is like if you if you give them such a rigid structure of saying now oh, you have only this option, this option, this option, you're only limited them to like five options on the ball if it's the centre back playing out from the back. Um so like in regards to your sort of like training methodology, would you say that you're on um, you adopt like a bit of a tactical periodization sort of method? Yeah. Basically my my um, weekly structure is quite quite simple. Uh, I try to cover the four macro micro areas of uh, of uh, of the game model, which are possession, uh, trans of uh, negative trans defensive transition, uh, non possession, and of uh, attacking transitions. So the four main areas, and usually I, I do this the, this on uh, the first day. Uh, so usually Tuesday, uh, I work on possession, building up from the back, plus the defensive transition. So this is something that I always want because once again, how can I coach the possession without taking account of the possibility to lose the ball? So the second, the second day, the, the following day, I coach the non-possession and usually in that um, day, specific day, I, I split the groups. I work a lot with the, the back four or back three, whatever. And uh, uh, and that how what we do if we win the ball because this is important too so we defend okay if we win the ball what we do we we reshuffle the the the, 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 the ball or we we counter whatever the third day once again possession but now is is about creating the last uh, attack let's say we call it preparation uh, i don't know how you call it in english but you say yeah, finish the attack <laughs> yeah yeah and uh, so it's a place basically is to to build and to keep the ball more uh, for keep the ball uh, ahead on the field and once again losing the ball what can happen if we if we lose the ball we re, we 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 try to win it back or we retreat and we defend whatever and the fourth the fourth day we work once again, on uh, non-possession, but higher on the field, like pressing high, uh, winning the ball, and try to finish straight away. So the four main uh, areas are covered. And then, of course, every single day, 
but this is something I use as a, let's say, as a frame, but uh, I'm not very interested to follow strictly this, you know, this uh, setup. I, if I see something that doesn't, uh, is not exactly the, the, the priority, I do it anyway. Okay, so um, you, you told us now about like um, the sort of structure and whatnot. And um, you just started to touch on the fact that, like, yeah, music kind of has like a sort of, you know, structure or schedule to do it, but um, you don't stick to it. But one thing that um, stuck out to me, which uh, I find uh, more and more interesting because more and more coaches are doing it now, is in terms of adding a certain phase and then the transition element. But before, back in the day, they used to coach the transition element um, separate to that. So. Can you just talk a bit about the rationale behind that? Like, what's the yeah. reason? Uh, I I can uh, uh, answer to your question with another question. How can you coach transitions without the previous phase or the following phase? So once again, I uh, transition is something that you can uh, let's say you can coach the, the the players how to deal with the transition, but you cannot coach your players about when the transition will, uh, will occur. Think about this. So, uh, how can I coach a transition uh, creating the situation for the transition itself? Uh, it's, it's, it's fake. Um, I remember I had a, a, a debate with a coach who, who told me uh, exactly these words. I coach the negative transition he said to me, uh, by keeping one ball in my hand and the players, there is a playing, a game, let's say, then at some, all of a sudden, I throw another ball and I give the ball to the player in non-possession in, uh, in possession, and in, this is the starting moment of the transition. And I told him, listen, how can I, uh, as a player, be focused on what you are doing with the ball in your hand when I try to defend maybe I'm, I'm shifting my, 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 my attention to, to, to what is going on with the, in the reality with the ball so this is something fake I think that transition uh, you have to coach especially the transition is something that you have to coach within the reality of the game let's say when uh, once again talking about the, the building up from the back uh, when my players trying to build up from the back and the opponents win the ball this is the transition this is a, the, the start the starting moment of the uh, of the transition and then i have to coach the, the the behavior of my players within the transition during the transition but i can tell my players i can coach my players about what how to to deal with the transition let's say uh, now I'm talking about, let's say, preparation of the attack the, in the, let's say, in the, in, the, um, in the opponent half. I give my players just two options, two. There are not many options. The first option is we want to win the ball back straight away. The second option is we reshape, we let the player, the opponent have the ball and we, we regroup and we defend in the middle. What the players have to do by their own reading of the game is to understand what option I have to take to, 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 to use, let's say. And the, 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 the principle are, if there are many of us in the area of the ball, we try to win it back straight away. If the player who lost the ball is uh, maybe uh, alone in a, uh, in a in a, in, a, in a wide area, for example, without any teammates in, uh, close to him, then we, we cannot try to win it back straight away. Then we reshape. So this is about what the players can read during the game. But once again, I can coach this only uh, through the reality of the game. So a real game scenario. I cannot do by creating a, the... Um, a structure of the session or a drill where at some point the ball is lost. Uh, <laughs> no, 
I have to to coach this uh, in the in the reality of the game. So I think that uh, yeah, that that makes sense. Um, and it's like that um, example that you brought that the other coach used. It's not that it's not like oh, it's not necessarily working on like the mentality switch. But then it's not realistic because if they're playing on the left hand side of the pitch and then you're dropping the ball on the right hand yeah. side. So yeah. yeah, what's the point? What's the point? I I think that this uh, let's say this. Um, trick, coaching trick, is uh, useful only in one situation. If you work on uh, uh, prevent, prevention marking, so let's say you are working on, uh, so your team in possession is trying to finish, in, you know, we are higher on the field. And I want, for example, that my center back uh, goes on prevention marking with a, with a higher opponent, you know. If I, if I realize that he is this is distracting himself, so he's not focused on this. Then I can throw the ball to the to the striker to make it, you know, uh, to make him aware of this. Uh, but this is something different. It's just that something that I use to 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 re, re, uh, regain the focus of the the center. But but in terms of transition, I cannot create something. Uh, disconnected from, from the reality. And it's the same for the offensive transition, attacking transition. It's exactly the same. So I cannot use, let's say, a fake situation where the opponent intentionally lose the ball to create the, the, of the attacking transition. Because if I know what's going on, then it's fake. You know, it's like the big brother, you know, the program. No, no one is real. Uh, in that programs because they know that there is the camera that's watching them is some is similar uh, I don't know if it makes sense no it definitely does it's like um, it, there's certain moments where you may want to just attack like an individual uh, in, in that whole collective uh, and just like highlight to them you know potentials of like the what ifs like what yeah. if, you don't, if you don't stick to that if you don't stick to that player there one ball and then that player can be through on our goal sort of thing so highlighting that sort of issue there exactly, exactly. Um, i just want to hark it back a bit on to your journey so uh you now went on to coach at inter milan and that was uh, um, within the academy start and then you went and got the gig at swindon as the assistant manager of paolo now but even before that period i just wanted to talk as a whole is in terms of what sort of differences have you seen in terms of coaching for performance, like coaching to win and coaching to just develop uh, professional players. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, 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 main, uh, the main point is uh, uh, co coaching to win. Uh, it requires attention to some, de not de some details uh, that uh, can, can win you the game. Uh, maybe uh, let's say m a lot of, mm, of attention to set pieces for example which is something that to be honest with you with my youth teams I'm not so uh, focused on uh, I prefer to spend half an hour to, to, to coach a principle of play rather than try to build a, a Let's say a dead ball uh, routine that can me can can work can win a game. I'm not interested. But when you coach the first team level, and this happened to me as assistant manager, but also when I was head coach in Finland, uh, I I spent maybe the Saturday morning the, the last the last session working on uh, set pieces routine or something like that. But that is the probably the main the main point and. Uh, um, in terms of principles, I, I, I think that the same principle that, that um, build my, uh, my game model when I coach young players or adult players remain the, basically remain the same. Uh, then game model uh, can, can, uh, can change uh, according to the to the age of play the players, but to the to the let's like we said the the, the final uh, outcome that you want to 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 achieve. Uh, for example, uh, with my team, I have a to be honest a team 
always since I started to coach at as Roma, the young players are very talented, and uh, we usually we dominate the games. And I'm I'm very keen to see my two fullbacks going forward together and uh, remain just with two center backs center backs at the back. If I coach the first team, probably I will ask one of the two fullbacks to 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 be a bit more you know negative minded or one midfielder to to drop uh, between the two center backs to have a bit more protection because i know that the opponent if they win the ball they can uh, damage you so that details can um, can can change i mean but if i think that if i believe in some principles and those principles are um, effective uh, for me and uh, and can work for a first team they then uh, can work also for the for, for the youth teams um, then of course when I was uh, assistant manager to Paolo I have to be honest his game model his principles of play were in some way uh, not exactly what I'm believed in uh, some of them but as assistant manager my first duty was to 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 stick with uh, with the, what the manager wanted to do so uh, if you want to be a good assistant you you have always to show uh, the players that you believe 100% in what the, man, the manager is doing then of course with the manager you can discuss about you know something and but then in front of the team the players have to think that the manager and the, the first team coach thinks exactly uh, are on the same uh, page. And just on that, you know, you talk there about being an assistant manager, and I'm certain no doubt there's um, many of us have probably been in that situation before, and I'm sure many will still go on to be in that position in the sense that they're going to be working with another coach who, or they're working in a particular environment where they're not fully. They don't fully buy into the principles or the beliefs or the values of that environment and I guess are maybe in some cases forced because of the environment, because they maybe financially need that job or whatever it is to have to work under that. Would you mind just talking to that a little bit, some of the challenges that presents for you or for yourself in your journey? Um, and beyond that, it'll be interesting to know how, how, your, how your relationship with Paolo came to be in the first place. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can start from from the um, this, this uh, last uh, last uh, question you made. Uh, um, Paolo and myself, up, um, we 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 met uh, in a coaching course in Italy. Uh, as I said, I never been a, a, a professional player at that high level. In that course, there were other top professional play, former players in Italy, like uh, Di Biagio, Di Livio, uh, Ganz, Pagliuca, other top top. Uh, players. Uh, I never met Paolo before, but since we started to, as uh, you know, like what happened in a, in a coaching course, you start to work as groups, small groups, and you start to share ideas. I remember at the end of the course, he came to me and he said, uh, he, he liked my, my philosophy, my idea, uh, and uh, he, he told me, if I will ever start my coaching journey, I will uh, probably ask you to, to join me. Uh, and he, he he did it because after three years it was made it this uh, coaching course in 2008, and uh, it was in 2011 where we uh, when we, we we went to England, and uh, to be honest I was proud to, to 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 join him because then of course I was coaching in lower leagues in Italy and then the chance to, the opportunity to. To, to go abroad, especially in a country like England, was for me was a, a dream, like living a dream. And um, um, the challenge I I, I, I had with, uh, um, especially with Paolo, was to uh, let's say to match his uh, big big ego, big personality. Uh, uh, some, of course, you uh, you all know the the, the, the career, fantastic career he had, especially in England. And uh, uh, he is what what uh, what he is. He is uh, is a big big ego, uh, 
he needed probably someone like me more low profile uh, i don't think uh, no one could resist with him with uh, having his own uh, the same the same uh, uh, type of uh, of personality otherwise there would be a clash of of personalities you know uh, i of course i have my personality but i'm very much uh, always balanced in my in my um behavior very i am very pondering everything you know i am and probably he needed this and we uh, we matched very well together um because of probably because of this my 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 side my i was the uh, the the moon and it was the sun <laughs> if you if you like um it, it, i remember that uh we never had really uh conflicts um because he was that kind of guy that i when i you, you it's like when, i told something to him my opinion and the first thing i his first answer was, was no you know for example talking about a new exercise no 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 then one week after fab can we start to to do what you said last week so and it was everything like this because he's the kind of guy that wants to show that he's in charge but then he has the intelligence to understand when he, he can do what someone who trust uh, uh, like him he was he trusted me a lot and um, so that was the kind of uh, relationship uh, then of course the, the challenges for me were to to switch to shift from uh, a, a low level uh, coaching so level teams uh, to to a professional environment like swindon you know because even if it was fourth the fourth tier of football uh, uh, league but uh, still you know when you have to play in front of 10,000, 9,000, it makes a big, big difference. Um, I was quite, um, let's say, uh, my life was quite easy because my English was already acceptable. So I never had problems in communication with the, with the players. And uh, so um, that was the, the challenges. Yeah, that... that it was also because I have to be honest, even when I was uh, coaching in, in the lower leagues in Italy, I always tried to do this in a professional way. So I wanted always to 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 keep myself uh, in a even if I wasn't a professional, uh, I I tried to do things in a professional way, and this helped me when I moved to a real professional environment. So. I was already able to use, for example, match analysis uh, because I w my my real my my main job with the, with Paolo uh, wasn't really on the field because it was typically Italian coach who wanted to to have to be let's say uh, hands on you know on the on the coaching session. I was the one who probably I prepared the coaching session, but he was the one to lead to lead the coaching session. And uh, my job was very much behind the scenes. I was studying the opponents, studying the, the you know, the, the weakness uh, of the opponents, the strength of the opponents, and I prepared a lot of reports on the on the on the teams that we we're gonna face. And Paolo was uh, uh, very, I think, happy with my job because I remember one thing that made me proud was that. In the team meetings with the with the team with the players, Paolo uh, spoke uh, my words. You know, he didn't even wanted to check if what I was preparing was uh, was uh, was right. So he trusted completely my my uh, opinion, and uh, so and that worked because, to be honest with you, especially at Swindon, we had a lot of uh, success. We won the, 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 the League Two straight away, as you can remember, probably. And the following season, we were on you know, top of the League One. And then something happened um, behind the scenes, you know, with, the, with the, this uh, taking over of the club. And uh, we decided to, to, to resign. And then the rest is history at, at Sunderland.
just just on that, you talk there about you know uh, your first season and it being very successful. What do you think it was within that first year at Swindon? Obviously, you guys went on to win the League Two trophy, uh, League Two title. Sorry, what do you think it was that was, or what do you think were the key ingredients to that success? I think the 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 key of that success was uh, uh, the players by the the, the to both in. Uh, what what Paolo and ourselves as a staff wanted to to implement, you know. Um, I remember the players were keen to to draw from a, a, a legend like like Paolo, because uh, like it or not, all the players uh, when they have to um, when it comes to 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 deal with the coach, to create a relationship with the coach. If this coach has been a top player, uh, then there is something that they want to to draw from. Maybe if you are, if you, there is nothing, uh, after one week, two weeks, one month, uh, they they will lose the let's say the respect. But Paulo was also a very good coach, not just a, a good former player. He was a very very good coach on the field and uh, uh, I remember all the players were um, wanted to, to play for him uh, even if he was tough uh, with, with them uh, uh, players if you for example if you can read any uh, interview uh, to Matt Ritchie you know the, the players Newcastle players player he always said that uh, his uh, luck luck was to 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 be to play under Paul because he made the step forward as a as a footballer, especially um, with regard to self um, care. You know, like diet, uh, training sessions to train. So basically, uh, what Paulo tried to to. To, to bring with those players were was discipline in terms of train with uh, hundred always hundred um, percent private life and then when you start to win games and the players start to understand that uh, this works for them and then everything flows and everything follows but yes I think that the, the main uh, the key point was the players' um, willingness to, to to follow what Paolo tried to to to, to bring to the to the team. Brilliant. And just on that, you need know, you moved from obviously now going from Swindon to Sunderland, now working in the Premier League. You know, I can imagine just the, you know a number of years before, maybe what, four or five years before you're working in a semi-pro amateur amateur uh, league in Italy. Now all of a sudden you've gone from that to work in a league to now to the Premier League. Mm. What was that like? Uh, even before going to Sunderland, you know, uh, I always remember uh, the moment when when we played the final, uh, the um, JP Trophy final uh, at Wembley Stadium against Chesterfield, and it was exactly one year after. I left my job as a head coach in Italy in a sixth tier team. One year, exactly one year after, I entered my with the with the team uh, to for the warm up in, in uh, Wembley. So think about the feeling that I I, I, I experienced. You know, was like. I, am I dreaming? Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, exactly, exactly. It was unreal. Uh, even more, even more than uh, the first game in the Premier League. It was at uh, Stamford Bridge against Chelsea away. Of course, you know, uh, it's something that in my, of course, uh, entire life I will never, I will never forget, um, because it's so big, it's so huge. Uh, everything is so. I don't even have the words in English to to express my my feelings in those days, and feeling of gratitude also to Paolo because he he tried he he wanted me to to join him and uh, then of course I did my 
my part. I made my part. I made my job. I jo I worked very hard to 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 be mm, let's say uh, to make him proud of my of me. And mm, I have to say that I will be grateful for, to him from 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 for life because uh, he gave me the chance to to live something that I think is. A, the dream of every single coach in the world to, to coach at some point in the Premier League, and I, I and I had this uh, chance. Uh, I, but uh, yes, to, to the moving from uh, from League Two or League One from Swindon to Sunderland was a great uh, step forward. But but then, uh, in at some, uh, somehow wasn't, in my opinion, the right moment. Uh, I think it was a bit too soon. Or? Yes, uh, I don't want to say too soon to move to Sunderland. I I would like to 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 make it in another way. So it was uh, the wrong choice to leave Swindon. Uh, we probably we f we was forced to leave Swindon mm -hmm. because of those problems that were mm, behind the scenes. You know. Uh, but uh, in the hindsight, if we were if we remained at Swindon, I'm sure we we would uh, won the, the league once again, and probably uh, Swindon would have moved to Championship, and then things would have been different because I think that Swindon uh, was the right the right environment for for Paulo because he was a sort of hero there, you know. Uh, because uh, after, especially after the, the first season, where when we won the league, uh, after a lot many years, uh, we Paolo could could do what what he want, you know, what he, he wanted, uh, because the fans were, loved him, the, the club was uh, was right for us, and the, the environment, it, everything was perfect. Uh, also, private um, in terms of uh, personal life. Uh, my family was fine there, so all of a sudden we were forced to to leave. We decided to leave. Paolo decided to leave, and and uh, we we followed him as a staff. I think that uh, probably even Paolo, uh, if he could do differently, would would do. Uh, to move to Sunderland was a, a big big step forward, but uh, you know in football we, we say that what what work. In, a, in an environment, can can can, can do differently in a, in a different environment. So um, there is no uh, nothing uh, is granted. It, it, you, you can't take something for granted. And what worked at Swindon didn't work at Sunderland uh, because different players, different uh, level, of course. Uh, what worked uh, with the Swindon players didn't work with Swin with the Sunderland players because they didn't want to buy in what Paolo wanted from them. Um, I would say few players were rotten apples there. And to be honest with you, we tried to get rid of those players. We couldn't. And you can see now Sunderland, what is, you know, they are where they are now, I would say part of the uh, responsibility is for of, uh, not having been able to get rid of those players without mentioning them. And I guess um, not <laughs> the stone away from being a bit controversial is like um, it's a different sort of dynamic uh, in terms of the, on both clubs that you're managing there in terms of with Swindon, you're, you're pushing for winning the league and promoting, and with Sunderland, it was a bit more about the survival element. Um, did you see any sort of changes then in, in, in regards to the way you, you guys approached games in that sense? Then were you a bit more conservative in the way that you wanted them to play uh, in Sunderland in comparison? Yeah, to yeah. Uh, yes, of course, it was. Uh, when you th if you think that when uh, when we were at Swindon, all all the mm, the games, especially at home, but not only at home, also away, were mm, built to push the the pedal, you know, and uh, uh, 
and stay in front of the game, dominate the game, uh, try to score straight away and then uh, control the game. While when we went to Sunderland, it was completely different because the players, especially the first season, so we went there when uh, uh, seven games to, to, to go, um, we, we, we replaced uh, Martin O'Neill and uh, the, cl the team was in a sort of free falling. And uh, when we came there, base, mm, it was the right, mm, the, the, the only moment where the players uh, tried to, mm, let's say, uh, accept everything Paolo wanted to, from them because they had no choices, you know, they had no other options. So we want them to play in a certain way and they did it. Uh, of course, it was always the same system because I remember Paolo liked to play with 4-4-2. Uh, but what was in Swindon was a 4-4-2 that was also almost a 4-2-4. At Sunderland, it was a more, almost a 4-4-1-1 because, of course, it changed the, the, the dynamic of the game. The, the opponents uh, are different. And then you have to be more conservative, like you said, Ben. Uh, but I think the problem was the second season because Paolo, the Paolo's nature is to try to always try to, to win, to, uh, to be positive, you know. But we didn't have the, the right players and probably the mis main mistake was to uh, uh, un not understand straight away that that, that kind of football was uh, probably was, wasn't the right one for a, for, a, for a club like San, for a team like Sunderland, you know. And the players if the expectations of the coach and the reality don't match, the players start to uh, panic and then everything starts to, to fall to fall apart. This was happened uh, the second season at Sunderland, probably. Just, uh, just coming back to your own journey now and obviously your own personal development, I'm just curious to know, obviously, you touched there on, uh, I guess, how much of an influence Paolo had on you in that period of time. Obviously, some of the other roles that you've done in, uh, in your journey from starting out. I just wanted to know whether you had any major influences in terms of possibly a, a mentor, whether that be for, formally or informally, where you felt like there's a lesson that you've taken from them that has been so crucial to your, your journey now. Um, I just wondered if there was anyone in, the, in that shape or form and if you could just share what that lesson was. Uh, to be honest with you, I, uh, uh, I never had a mentor in terms of some co a coach who um, taught me uh, something. I tried to take something from the coaches I had in the past, even if it was a low league football. I remember I had the coach who unfortunately died many years ago. But I remember him as someone who was exactly the kind of coach I want to have as a player. Uh, someone who you, you at, at some point you realize that you want to play for him. You know, you don't know why, but there, there's something that uh, make you yourself uh, keen to to show that you're good, and you want to do it from for him. So this is something I want always want to to be for my players. Uh, to, to be someone you want to, to, to make proud. I think that it, probably this is one of the main points, the main key for a, for, a, for a coach. To have players that uh, in some way feel, uh, they feel you as a, as a leader, real leader. And uh, in terms of coaching, or in terms of philo football philosophy, I think that one of the main uh, uh, figures I had uh, to follow well, is still is uh, Maurizio Sarri uh, in terms of football uh, co football philosophy. I first it was Pep Guardiola uh, with his Barca team, which was something you know that I think everyone would like to to follow. Uh, but in Italy, I think that. Um, Sarri, when it was at Napoli, um, made something that changed um, a lot. The, 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 in it, at least in Italy, no. And uh, I I know that, that 
watching that team, I think I always thought this is the kind of football I want to play with my team. Uh, effective football, attractive football. Uh, sometimes you, you, we talk about attractive football, but attra attractive football, but not effective. I think that that Napoli team was exactly uh, what you want from a team. Nice to see, nice to watch, and very effective. And uh, I have to be honest, uh, the main uh, uh, satisfaction I, had, I have here at S Roma is to have players, um, young players that are good enough to, to try and play that kind of football. And this is something that make, that make me, every, every single game, every single training session, uh, make me happy. Because, because uh, uh, my in that kind and in that sense, I can say that my expectations match the reality, and this is, I think, that this is one of the most uh, important things for a, for a for a coach. So you talk there about some of the influences that have, you know you've had in your journey so far, and now to be interested within that and leading on from that, what helps you to stay motivated and keep yourself? Um, working towards becoming, I guess, better and trying to get better each day? Uh, yes, of course. The, f the first thing that uh, keeps me motivated is uh, surviving in the, in the game <laughs> because, uh, you know, football is a, is a, is a strange world and uh, uh, we all live uh, in, in terms of year by year or two years <laughs> according to the type of contract you have. This is the reality. But uh, you know, this is something. Of course, uh, I don't. I don't want to sound too greedy. <laughs> it's just no. But what keeps me motivated is my desire to to improve myself always, not only in terms of uh, moving up the ranking, you know, as a coach, uh, but also to 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 be a better person, to be a better coach for my players, and. Um, by by doing this, I always find uh, the way to, and I always try to to improve myself. I I read a lot. I try to understand not only football, but I lo I I read and I study neuroscience because I think that if we understand how we work, how our brain works, uh, we can uh, understand how to to be more effective with uh, with uh, our coaching uh, uh, sessions. Um, so I, I always this yeah exactly this so trying to be better than what i was yesterday and um, i it's it's not uh, this not doesn't guarantee that uh, you you'll be more successful but at, at least uh, it can guarantee to to be a better a better coach a better person for a, the, the people and the, per, the the players that uh, work uh, with me Definitely, I think that's very, you know, it's a quite a positive mindset and ultimately a growth mindset you want to continue to develop and learn and become better each day. And I think the whole, that piece you've mentioned there about become better coach than you were yesterday, um, I think that's very important. Just on that then, um, throughout your journey from starting out to now, what would you say are some of maybe your biggest uh, bugbears when it comes to coaching? So anything that, anything that particularly you might see commonly that frustrates you about the coaching and the people, maybe the way people coach or the perceptions of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, what annoy me, what annoys me and always did in football is though are those people, people that just because they work in football, they, they felt uh, like, uh, you know, better people or, uh, you know, they, they think that uh, they, they have something more than the other, than the, Common people, um, and it's, this is something very typical in Italy, especially in the lower leagues. You know, people that maybe is a coach in a third division think that they, they know everything. Or uh, um, this is the kind of people that annoy me in football. Uh, our arrogance annoy, annoys me a lot in football. Uh, racism annoys me a lot in, in football. Um, ignorance annoys me a lot in football. Um, so I'm. I, I think that uh, uh, 
respect is the is the is the main word is the main key respect the players respect the people that uh, works in uh, so i always been like that and uh, i think i will always be so what what uh, annoys me is uh, disrespect and the ignorance and uh, those kind of things definitely so then just like you know leading on from that then what would you say some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in your own coach's journey have been the biggest challenge probably is uh, uh, for from those coach coaches like myself who uh, didn't have a, a, a top career as a footballer, you have to struggle three times the other to 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 make it. This is what. I don't know probably if it's the same in England, in UK, UK or other places, but at least in Italy is this, is like this. So uh, sometimes I see um, people, players that just finished their playing career yesterday, tomorrow they have a, a, a already a, a job as a coaches without any experience, without any um, anything, you know. But they they are given the job just for because they 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 were top players i don't think this is something that can uh, uh, give credit to to the to the to football because i think that uh, like saki said once uh, you if you if you were a good horse you 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 cannot be a jockey uh, so two different things i think that to be to have to have an to have been a good footballer can give you something more, can give an extra, but is 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 not what you need to be a good coach. And to be honest, I experienced this on on myself, especially in the last few years, that uh, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how uh, is your knowledge, no matter how uh, you are respected in the game, but there will be always some former player that will have a better chance. Uh, you know, to to coach maybe at the at top at better level, and I don't think this is and this is probably the, the the big challenge for those coaches like me to try to remain in the game and to try to uh, to be successful even if you if you your name doesn't mean anything uh, as a as a pre previous in a previous career as a footballer. And um, just in regards. Uh to like your journey and um, it's been a long one it's been a prosperous one but like if you can turn back time and talk to a younger Fabrizio uh, what would be your message to him? As a, as a person uh, I would probably congratulate with him uh, for his journey because uh, probably this is something related to what I just said but as a coach, I would tell him Fab, because Fab is what is the way they, they call me in England. Fab, make thing, things simple. Keep it simple. Uh, the, the main mistake that all the young coaches do, in my opinion, is to try to build coaching sessions with uh, uh, over structures and uh, trying to invent something, reinvent the wheel. You have to make it simple. Bibs, balls, goals, and people playing football. This is, in my opinion, what I would do differently in my first five, six years as a coach, where I try to always try to think about think about new things to to maybe to impress my players and th make them think that I'm a good coach. But I don't think it works. So the good coach is th the one, in my opinion, is the one who. Uh, don't show, doesn't show that he is good, but make the players feel better players. Just on that, though, you know, you touched on that. I was really interested to know how, how, how much of that eagerness to impress comes from not having that pro previous playing career. I I wouldn't put in this way because to be honest, when I started coaching, I was in an environment that was uh, fitting my 
um, level as a player. So basically, when I was the first, my first year as a head coach in the lower leagues, uh, for my players, I was what Paolo was for Swindon players. So because I, I was a very good lower league player. So basically, my players look at at me as someone who was a top player for that level. Um, I think that um, to try to to show that you are good is something that uh, has more um, about uh, yourself. So uh, you want to to or to be compared with other coaches. So I remember that when I was watching maybe some uh, coach training session from older coaches than me, I was watching something that I'm trying to do now, so, uh, what I'm doing now. But at the time I was thinking, hey, they just play football. What is this? So I can do this. So I want, and then I wanted to do something strange, you know, um, to impress maybe or to, to try to, to be different from the others. But then you realize that is a is an attempt that leads you uh, just to confusion, and the players are confused. Uh, you have to um, have this clear picture in your mind, and uh, make sure that the players buy in what is in your mind. All the the other things in between are just overstructure. Uh, so once again. Um, if I could talk with uh, with the young Fab, I would say, "Hey, take off these small goals, take off these poles, take off from the field. You know, take off all these uh, strange uh, movements that the players have to do. Just make them play and uh, show them what they are doing well or not, while while they are playing." This is, in my opinion, what uh, what I I realized after almost 18 years of coaching. Mm. And you know that we're taking a bit of a journey back, and obviously talking to young Fab now. So now, if we're looking at yourself, where you are now, currently under 17 head coach at Roma. What's what's next for Fabrizio Pigreta? Uh, I'm 55. Uh, I had the chance in my career to 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 leave uh, something that I would never probably dreamed of. Uh, Premier League. Uh, I realistically, I think that. I will not probably reach that level again in my life. I have to be. I, I'm a very grounded dreamer, <laughs> if you like. So uh, next, what's next? Uh, I think that my I, I work. I, I work for a good a good club, a good a great club. I would say. Uh, I would like to progress uh, within the club. Probably maybe one day to coach the under 19, which is a very very good uh, level for this kind of Italian football. Um, if I will have the chance to, to coach one, once again a, a, a first team, I will do that. But I'm not, once, as I said before, I want to be in the job until, uh, until uh, I can. And uh, always try to have the, 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 the chance to have options rather than be forced to accept everything. This is what uh, what is uh, my my purpose. So um, I have uh, uh, in front one new season with uh, with a very good good group of players uh, with the under 17, and uh, the future will tell. Brilliant. And just as we start to wind down, I was wondering if we had, if you had 60 seconds now to kind of leave our listeners and our viewers with one golden nugget to take away and maybe think about uh, being able to apply that in their own journeys. What would that be? Um, there would be more than one, but... Um, Feel free to share. Feel free to share. Free to share. Uh, first, what I said before, uh, be respectful of the people around you. Um, be curious. Don't be satisfied of what you know and what you had in the past. And uh, prepare yourself always to, to, for the best. Because if, like happened to me, if something happened, you have to be ready. And uh, 
don't don't wait for the chance to prepare but be prepared before brilliant preparation is the key yes um just one final question we have for you now uh Fritzio. you talked there about you know being 55 and not maybe uh being a grounded dreamer and potentially not really a maybe getting to the Premier League standard again. As your career starts to wind down, and eventually when it does, um, you know, you're going to go into retirement, hopefully, you know, with all your birds and the great scenery behind you. But just curious, what would you want your legacy to be once your career has come to an end? Excuse me, I... I yeah, I get... so what, what would you want your legacy to be? So how would you, how would you want people to remember you? Um... I would like to be remembered by all my players as someone who touched their life, not only their football career. Simple as that. Because I think that if you can connect with the play, with the person before then the player, the player will uh, remember you uh, for uh, for their life with like someone who uh, influenced them in a positive way. This is what uh, I want to be remembered as a, uh, in, as a coach. Brilliant. I think I see, you know, simple is the key. Preparation is the key. And also, you know, I think what you touched on there about being not just a good coach and we remember for the coaching that you've done with him, but how you've impacted the lives. Because ultimately, a lot of the players, especially when you're working in youth development, a lot of these players aren't going to become professional footballers, unfortunately. Um, there's not, there's only so much room uh, for everyone, but I think if you can have an impact on those people as as people, then I think that you know that that has just as much reward as it does if you, in in terms of supporting them to become professional players. Absolutely, especially especially for those who who, who will not make it. Yeah, definitely. Well, there you have it, guys. It's been another fantastic discussion again today. Some brilliant insights, plenty of golden nuggets uh, for everyone to take away and apply. Um, I think the most important one there, obviously, simplicity and planning is the key. Keep it simple. But I just want to say thanks again for tuning in, everyone. As usual, I've been joined by my co-host, Ben. Uh, but a very special thanks to our guest today, Fabrizio Picoretto, under-17s head coach at Roma. Thank you again for your time today, Fabrizio. Thank to you guys, and uh, it's been a great pleasure. And uh, I wish you all the best for, uh, for uh, your life and for your uh, job. Perfect. Thank you. So, guys, do get in touch. Let us know your thoughts, what your key takeaways were from today. If there's anything that you um, thought was really insightful, that would be fantastic to know as well. And on that note, uh, Fabrizio, I'm not sure if you've got any uh, social media where anyone can get touch, in touch with you if they wanted to. Uh, through via LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. I have a Twitter account. I have a LinkedIn account. So I'm very keen to, to, to share my, my ideas and to get in touch with uh, whoever I want to. Well, there you have it, guys. Another episode of the Coaches Network podcast, where our aim is to bring the world of athlete, talent, and personal development together to just one platform. And you can help us with that mission right now by sharing this episode or any of your favorite episodes with everyone that you can think of. You can tag us in those mentions as well on Instagram at the Coaches Network or on Twitter at the Coaches Net. We look forward to hearing from you. Let us know what you thought about today's episode. And until next time, guys, take care.